Hello and welcome to the ISTQB Foundation Level Training and Certification Program. Single solution for your preparation. This accredited course is going to teach you each and everything you need to know to become a successful ISTQB certified professional. While other courses only cover the theoretical concepts, our course not only covers these theoretical concepts but also covers real-time examples. In addition, we make sure you remember the topics by providing revisions, quizzes and different exercises. The highlight of this course is that it contains topic-wise explanation, topic-wise quizzes, chapter-wise quizzes, 11 question papers from 2017 to 2020, two practice sets to practice before you attend the exam. In total, you will get more than 1,500 questions, which is enough to clear the real ISTQB exam. Our courses are not developed by just one person, but a special team of highly qualified professionals and experienced educators who are working in the leading industries. This includes subject matter experts to help you with technical topics, trained voiceover artists to make sure you get a great audio learning experience, and experienced graphic designer to enhance the visualization. We have a wide experience in teaching online and we have more than 30 popular courses listed in online platform for different certifications. It is our genuine pleasure to use all our experience and expertise to train you and help you obtain an official ISTQB certification. As of now, we are teaching in 143 countries with more than 1 lakh students and still growing. Now it's your turn to join our growing family and become part of it. In return, you will get advice from industry experts who will help you throughout the course. Join ISTQB Foundation Level Training by enrolling now and become part of us. There is no need to worry. This course is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. You got nothing to lose. Let's get you ISTQB certified. Welcome to ISTQB Foundation Level Certification. To prepare properly and effectively, it's important that we know how many marks are coming from each chapter. That is what we will cover in this lecture. Chapter 1 is Fundamental of Testing. Here, you will be asked 8 questions. Chapter 2 is Testing Throughout the Software Development Lifecycle Model. From this chapter, you will be asked five questions. Chapter three is static testing. From this chapter, you will get five questions to answer. Chapter four is test techniques. This is the most important chapter. From this chapter, you will get 11 questions. The marks obtained from these chapters will be the deciding factor. Chapter five is test management. And from this chapter, you'll be asked nine questions. And finally, in chapter six, tool support for testing, you will get two questions. The marks distribution on this graph gives you a good idea of which chapter requires more of your focus. Keep this graph in mind while preparing for the exam. Before we start with the lecture, you must know the knowledge levels used for the syllabus. These knowledge levels mean the same for all the ISTQB certification courses, and they are categorized as K1, K2, and K3. Now let's see what they mean. K1 is level 1, which means remember. Here, the candidate will recognize, remember, and recall a term or concept. K2 is level 2, which means understand. Here, the candidate can select the reasons or explanations for statements related to the topic and can summarize, differentiate, classify, and give examples for facts, testing concepts, and test procedures. K3 is level 3, which means analyze. Here, the candidate can select the correct application of a concept or technique and apply it to a given context. K3 is normally applicable to procedural knowledge. So, in simple terms, just remember, K1 
means you need to remember the points and the question will be direct. K2 means the question will be based on comparison so that you have to understand the topic. K3 means application based questions. Here, you have to understand the concept and then apply it on the asked question. You need lots of practice to answer such a question. Let's answer a million dollar question. How to clear the ISTQB exam in the first attempt. Let me tell you this straightforwardly. ISTQB exam is not difficult, but tricky. Questions are asked in the way that you get confused. This is the success rate graph from the ISTQB official website. You can see that only 74% of the people could clear the ISTQB foundation level exam in their first attempt. So you must know what approach you should follow to clear the exam. I suggest this approach based on our experience. Step 1. Watch the video lecture. Step 2. Read the corresponding topic in the ISTQB official PDF. Step 3. Solve the quiz so you understand the type of questions asked previously. Step 4. If the topic is of type K3, solve as many practice questions as possible. We have provided many such questions in our course. Step 5. Solve the master quiz provided at the end of each chapter. I guarantee that you will get similar questions in the exam. Follow these five steps and for sure you will clear the exam. And yes, for any doubt, reach us directly. Our experts will help you throughout your preparation. I do apologize that there is not a shortcut for it, but once you complete this course, I am sure you will gain more knowledge and it will help you for the ISTQB exam and day-to-day -day testing activity. So, all the best for your ISTQB exam. Let's see how many questions we will get in the exam. The total number of questions are 40. The total duration provided to clear the exam is 60 minutes. And the passing mark is 26. So if you get 26 out of 40, you will get the certification. And each question gives one mark. According to my experience and students' feedback till now, 60 minutes is sufficient for the exam. And there is no negative marking for the wrong answers. So, answer all the questions. Welcome to Chapter 1, Fundamentals of Testing. At the end of this chapter, you must know these keywords. Coverage, Debugging, Defect, Error, Failure, Quality, Quality Assurance, Root Cause, Test Analysis, Test Basis, Test Case, Test Completion, Test Condition, Test Control, Test Data, Test Design, Test Execution, Test Implementation, Test Monitoring, Test Object, Test Objective, Test Oracle, Test Planning, Test Procedure, Test Process, Test Suite, Testing, Test Where, Traceability, Validation, and Verification. Whenever you come across these terms, pay more attention towards it. Along with the keywords, we have some learning objectives. Right now, we will not go through all these objectives, but we will address them all in the upcoming lectures. And in the starting of each lecture, I will inform you about its related learning objective. In this lecture, we are going to understand what is testing. 
We have two learning objectives under this topic. But before going to these topics, let's see the overview of testing. The first question is, what is software testing? Software testing is a way to assess the quality of the software and to reduce the risk of software failure in operation. Let's understand this definition. Once the developer develops software, the software is not directly given to the user. Before giving it to the user, the software undergoes a process to find out the defects and risks associated with the software, and this process is called testing. So by finding defects, we increase the quality of the software and reduce the risk associated with the software. Now you just have to remember this definition. Software testing is a way to assess the quality of the software and to reduce the risk of software failure in operation. Now the next question is, why software testing is required? Let's understand this with the help of an example. We find software all around in the form of business applications or customer products. Examples of business applications are when you go to the airport to book your ticket, or when you go to the supermarket to buy items, or when you work at the office. They are all run by software applications. And the example of customer products is washing machine, mobile phones, or coffee maker machine. They all contain software within them. What is your expectation from these softwares? The software shall work whenever we use them. And to ensure this testing of software is required, because software testing is a way to assess the quality of the software and to reduce the risk of software failure in operation. What will happen if the software does not work correctly? If the software does not work correctly, such softwares are called faulty software, and faulty software can result in loss of money, time, reputation, or in the extreme case can result in injury or death. Now let's see some real-time examples to understand these points. The first impact of faulty software is loss of money. This news was in the market that one particular car company recalled 2,000 of its cars due to issues with the front passenger airbag. Once such news hits the market, the share value of the company goes down and results in a huge loss of money. The second impact of faulty software is loss of time. Let's use the same example to understand this point. Due to recall, the company has to bring all the impacted cars to the garage, where they undergo repair, and at the same time the company has to do damage control. All this takes lots of effort and time. The third impact of faulty software is loss of reputation. In 2014, there was a breach in the security aspect of the eBay software. That means the software was not working as per the expectation. And if such news comes out, it results in loss of reputation. The fourth impact of faulty software is injury or death. Sometimes the defect can also result in injury or death. For example, if the airbag system doesn't work as expected. In this video, you can see that due to defects, the airbag is not inflated properly and may lead to severe consequences. With this, all the impacts of faulty software are covered, and they are loss of money, loss of time, loss of reputation, and injury or death. Now let's summarize the points. First, we covered the definition of software testing. Software testing is a way to assess the quality of the software and to reduce the risk of software failure in operation and, if the software does not work correctly, 
Such softwares are called as faulty software. Then we covered the impact of faulty software, and they are loss of money, loss of time, loss of reputation, and injury or death. In this lecture, we will see some of the misconceptions about testing. These are the three misconceptions which we are going to discuss in this lecture. Testing only consists of running test cases. Testing only involves the execution of the component or system being tested. Testing focuses entirely on verification of requirements. Let's address them one by one. The first misconception is, testing only consists of running test cases, which is completely wrong as testing is a process and consists of many activities as listed here. It consists of test planning, test monitoring and control, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, test completion. We will discuss each of these activities in detail in our future lecture. But for the time being, you need to remember these activities in the same order as listed here. Here, you have to remember, testing only consists of running test cases is a misconception. The second misconception is, Testing only involves the execution of the component or system being tested. This is also false, as testing consists of both dynamic and static testing. In dynamic testing, code is executed, whereas in static testing, code is not executed. Since in static testing, we do not execute code, but still it is considered as testing. The statement testing only involves the execution of the component or system being tested is a misconception. In the next lecture, we will explain the difference between both in more detail. For the time being, just remember testing consists of dynamic and static testing techniques. The third misconception is testing focuses entirely on verification of requirements. This is also false, as testing focuses on both verification and validation of the requirement. Verification means, are we building the product right? Whereas, validation means, to check if we built the right product. Again, I will provide a detailed lecture to explain the difference between both. As of now, remember testing focuses on verification and validation of the requirement. Now let's summarize all the points. In this lecture, we covered three misconceptions related to testing. Testing only consists of running test cases. Testing only involves the execution of the component or system being tested. Testing focuses entirely on verification of requirements. In this lecture, we are going to cover the objectives of testing. Here, the learning objective is to identify typical objectives of testing. Since this topic is marked as K1, you have to remember the points. Before we jump to the objectives, you must know what work product and test item mean. Work product is nothing but the output. Let's understand this. These are the steps followed during the development of software in an organization. The first step is to get user requirement. Then we develop system requirement. Then comes the global design. Next is detailed design. And the last step 
is an implementation where software is developed. When we say work product, in the system requirement stage, the output is a system requirement document. In the global design and detailed design stage, output is a design document and in the implementation stage, output is code. Therefore, we can say the work products are the system requirement document, design document, and code. So keep in mind, a work product means output. The next term which you need to know is the test item. The test item is also known as the test object. And it is defined as any document, component, or system which is under test. Let's see the same example to understand this. In the requirement stage, the requirement document is work product. Now, if this has to be reviewed, then the requirement is referred to as a test item. Similarly, if we are in the implementation stage, the output of this stage is code. And if we want to perform testing on it, then code is our test item. In simple terms, the object under test is referred to as a test object or test item. Now we will cover seven objectives of testing mentioned in this syllabus. The first testing objective is to prevent defects by evaluating work products such as requirements, user stories, design, and code. Let's understand this objective with an example. As we saw previously, the first stage of the development cycle is the requirement stage, where the requirement is gathered. The next stage is the design stage. In this stage, based on the requirement, the design is developed. After this comes the implementation stage, where code is written. Here, the code is implemented based on the design document. Now, suppose the requirement is wrong and it was not checked. This will result in wrong design, wrong implementation. But we can prevent such fault multiplication if we evaluate the work product before it is sent. To the next stage. Therefore, remember the first objective of testing is to prevent defects by evaluating work products such as requirement, user stories, design, and code is the objective of testing. The second objective states to verify whether all specified requirements have been fulfilled. Let's understand this. Suppose this is the customer requirement. For a web page, when the login details are given, the next page should load in a few milliseconds, and if login details are not correct, then show a pop-up. But if you look carefully, this requirement is not complete. There are open points. Few milliseconds mean how much time? Which page will load next? What is the pop-up content? These are the questions which need clarification so that we can fulfill the customer requirement. Like this, in each stage, we have to verify whether all specified requirements have been fulfilled or not. Remember the second testing objective is to verify whether all specified requirements have been fulfilled. The third objective states to check whether the test object is complete and validate if it works as the users and other stakeholders expect. As we know, test object means object under test. When you are in requirement stage, the requirement is your test object. In the design stage, the design is your test object. And at the implementation stage, code is your test object. Now let's continue with our example. As per the third objective, we need to provide input to the test object and check the output if it fulfills the stakeholder requirement. That means once the test item is ready, we need to execute it to see if it is fulfilling the customer's requirement or not. Therefore, remember, the third objective is to validate whether the test object is complete 
and works as the users and other stakeholders expect. The fourth objective is to build confidence in the level of quality of the test object. Let's understand this. Suppose we are in the requirement stage, then the requirement is our test object. And if we clarify our requirement in this stage itself, instead of clarifying it during the implementation stage, then we can build confidence in our requirement and finally in our product. To achieve this, we conduct the review after each stage to verify the work product quality. Remember the fourth objective is to build confidence in the level of quality of the test object. The fifth objective is to find defects and failures, thus reduce the level of risk of inadequate software quality. Let's understand this objective. As we know, the output of the requirement stage is the requirement document. If we find the defects or failures at this stage, we can reduce the defects at subsequent stages. It will improve the quality of the software and thus reduce the level of risk of inadequate software quality. Remember, the fifth objective is to find defects and failures, thus reduce the level of risk of inadequate software quality. The sixth objective is to provide sufficient information to stakeholders to allow them to make informed decisions, especially regarding the level of quality of the test object. When we find defects, we don't need to fix all of it before release. But what we can do is to provide sufficient information to the stakeholders regarding defects and risk associated with it, which will help the stakeholders to prioritize the future activities. The seventh objective is to comply with contractual, legal, or regulatory requirements or standards, and to verify the test object's compliance with such requirements or standards. Sometimes you need to fulfill the legal requirements. For example, if you are working for the automotive industry, then you need to fulfill ISO 26262 standard for the safety critical requirement. Before we end this lecture, let's understand the last point. Testing objectives are context dependent. Till now, we discussed general testing objectives whereas the objectives are context-dependent. Let's understand this point with the help of an example. Let's take two different test levels, component level and acceptance level. When you perform testing at the component level, your objective is to find as many defects as possible so that they are not found during operational use. Increase code coverage. Whereas if you are in acceptance level, your objective is to check if the system works as expected and satisfies requirements, to give information to stakeholders about the risk of releasing the system at a given time. So, in the different levels of testing, the objective changes. Now, let's summarize all the points. The seven objectives of testing are to prevent defects by evaluating work products such as requirements, user stories, design, and code, to verify whether all specified requirements have been fulfilled, to check whether the test object is complete and validate if it works as the users and other stakeholders expect, to build confidence in the level of quality of the test object, to find defects and failures thus reduce the level of risk of inadequate software quality, to provide sufficient information to stakeholders to allow them to make informed decisions, especially regarding the level of quality of the test object, to comply with contractual, legal, or regulatory requirements or standards, and to verify the test object's compliance with such requirements or standards.
In this lecture, we are going to understand about testing and debugging. Here, the learning objective is to differentiate testing from debugging. This topic is marked as K2, which means you have to understand the topic. First, we will have a look into testing activities. The most important activity of testing is to show failure because we know by now one of the objectives of testing is to find defect. Finding defect is not the only activity of testing. Other activity of testing is, once the defect is found, it is very much required to check if found defect is fixed or not. And the last point is testing is done by testers. Now let's have a look into the debugging activities. Most important activity of debugging is to analyze failure. Once the defect is analyzed and root cause is found, next activity is to fix the defect. And the last point is debugging is done by developers. Now here we will discuss how tester and developer works with respect to defect cycle. First, tester finds the defects. Then, the found defect is reported to the development team. After getting the defect report, development team starts investigating the failure. While investigating the failure, developer isolates the defect from rest of the software. Once the defect is isolated, developer fixes the defect and then checks defect is fixed or not. Once the defect is fixed, the fix report is sent to the testing team. After getting the fixed report from developer, tester retests on found defect to confirm if that they are really fixed. One more important point to remember is, in agile development and in some other life cycles, testers may be involved in debugging and component testing. Though in general debugging is developer's task, but in agile development model, which is very iterative, Sometimes debugging is done by testers. Before we end this topic, let's have a look into the difference between testing and debugging. The very first difference is that testing is performed by a tester and debugging is performed by a developer. The second difference is testing finds the programming failure, whereas debugging is to demonstrate that program is working fine otherwise show the root cause of the defect. The last difference is testing is done with the purpose of showing failures that are caused by defects, whereas debugging is the development activity that finds, analyzes, and fixes such defects. Now let's summarize all the points. Testing is done by the testers. Debugging is done by the developers. The purpose of testing is to show failures that are caused by defects in the software. The purpose of debugging is to find, analyze, and fix such defects. Agile model is an exception where debugging may be done by tester, with limited scope. In this lecture, we are going to address why is testing necessary? In order to understand this, we must remember that all of us are human. And being human, we make mistakes. And those mistakes can be very expensive. The expense can be loss of money. It can be a crucial loss of time. It can also be a loss of business reputation. And the final and gravest loss is death or injury due to our mistake. In order to avoid these losses and to minimize risk, we have to test every single aspect of our product. Now let's answer, why is testing necessary? The answer to that is, we need to perform testing to reduce risk, find defect, 
Meet contract fulfillment. We perform testing to reduce the risk associated with the product because it reduces the possibility of finding a bug during the live use. And how do we do that? By detecting the defect, which is our next point. We have to detect defects so that they are not seen in operational use. So, when the user is using our product, they should not be able to find these defects. It's our responsibility to find them first through testing. The third point is meeting the contract. We have to make sure that we are meeting all the commitments we made to our customers. So if the customer asks for something that is not included in the contract, this is where we find it. These are the reasons testing is necessary to the process of product development. Now let's see a real-time scenario to understand this topic. Let's say there is a developer who works on a code and creates a software. He then directly hands over that software to the customer. Now that the customer has a software, he uses it, but soon becomes very disappointed. Why? Because he has found an error in the software. It's not meeting his expectation. So now the question arises, why did the customer find the error and not us? The answer is that once the software was developed, we handed it over directly to the customer instead of going through the rigorous process of testing. If we had put the product through this process, it is possible that we could have caught the error before it ever reached the customer. And this is where I have to mention something crucial. We have to perform appropriate testing at appropriate levels. Now we will understand the meaning of appropriate testing at appropriate levels. The development of a product can be broken down into several levels of activity. At each level, we have to decide what is the appropriate testing that should be carried out. Let's take a look at these different levels of development activities. The first level is requirements. The second level is the design stage. After design comes coding. In the upcoming lecture, we will see how testing contributes to success at each of these levels. What you need to remember is, if we carry out appropriate testing at each level, then we will achieve a successful product. Let's summarize the important points. Testing is done to reduce risk, Find defect. Verify contract fulfillment. One need to perform appropriate testing at appropriate levels. In this lecture, we will focus on quality assurance and testing. Here, the learning objective is to describe the relationship between testing and quality assurance and give examples of how testing contributes to higher quality. This topic is marked as K2. To understand this topic, we must know what is quality. Quality is nothing but confirmation to the requirement. The first concept is quality assurance, which is also called QA. And the second concept is testing. People often think that quality assurance and testing are the same. This is a mistake. They are not the same, but they are related. But the question is, how are they related? They are related through a larger concept known as quality management. This concept ties them together. You have to remember that, while quality assurance and testing are not the same, they are related by a larger concept called quality management. Before we have a look into these terms, let's understand this concept first. Each organization has their quality management system, and to fulfill the directives of quality management, we have quality assurance, which includes different standards, for example, 
for Automotive Industry ISO 26262 standard shall be followed. Such standards are included in quality assurance. Now to check if the required standards are fulfilled or not, we have a quality control stage. In this stage, the quality process is provided in detail. In simple terms, it includes the detailed steps or actions to monitor if standards are fulfilled or not. The actions mentioned by the quality control stage is executed by testing. During testing, we use different techniques to evaluate the quality of the software. And then, defect report is prepared and analyzed. Now, let's look at the terms in more detail. The first term is quality management. This is a series of coordinated activities to direct and control an organization with regard to quality. Here, we are establishing a management system in an organization, and the objective of this management system is to achieve the quality requirement of the organization. What is quality management? It is a larger system introduced into an organization, which the single goal is to achieve the best quality. The next term is quality assurance. Quality assurance is a part of quality management, and the purpose of quality assurance is to focus on providing confidence that quality requirements will be fulfilled. And the third term is quality control or testing. It is the operational techniques and activities, part of quality management, that are focused on fulfilling quality requirements. Remember this point. Quality management is the larger system, which has two parts, quality assurance and quality control. Quality assurance contains all the documents that tell us what procedures to follow. And quality control is the activities that we have to perform in order to achieve the organization's quality requirements. Now, let's see the main difference between quality assurance and quality control in more detail. The first main difference is that quality assurance contains proper processes, while quality control has test activities. Quality assurance contains theoretical concept. Quality control is practical. The second main difference is that quality assurance is more about defect prevention. By laying out guidelines in documents, this helps prevent defects. But quality control is a defect detection mechanism. Different test techniques are used to detect defects. Let's summarize the points. Quality assurance and testing are not the same. Quality management ties quality assurance and testing together. Quality management includes all activities that direct and control an organization with regards to quality. Among other activities, quality management includes both quality assurance and quality control. Quality assurance is typically focused on adherence to proper processes in order to provide confidence that the appropriate levels of quality will be achieved. Quality control involves various activities, including test activities, that support the achievement of appropriate levels of quality. Test activities are part of the overall software development or maintenance process. Quality assurance contributes to defect prevention. Quality control is a defect detection mechanism. In this lecture, we will cover error, defect, and failure. Here, the learning objective is to distinguish between error, defect, and failure. This topic is marked as K2. First, we will cover the definition of error, defect, and failure, and then we will see the detailed explanation. The first term, 
is error. An error is defined as a human action that produces an incorrect result. Now let's relate this definition to software testing. If the developer finds a mistake in their own code, then it is referred to as the error. The second term is defect, which is also referred to as fault or bug. The defect is defined as a flaw in a component or system that can cause the component or system to fail performing its required function. Now let's relate it to the software testing. Once the tester finds the bug and the developer accepts it, then it is called as a fault. The third term is failure. It is defined as a deviation of the component or system from its expected delivery, service, or result. Now let's relate it to the software testing. Suppose you are using the software, but it hangs. That means if the product is in use and it's not working as expected, then it is a failure. Since these three definitions are important, I am repeating them again. An error is defined as a human action that produces an incorrect result. The definition for defect is a flaw in a component or system that can cause the component or system to fail performing its required function. Failure is defined as deviation of the component or system from its expected delivery, service, or result. Now we will see the detailed explanation of error, defect, and failure concepts so that you understand their differences. Let's understand this with the help of the development lifecycle. Suppose you got the user requirement. From this user requirement, the requirement engineer has to write the system requirement. Now suppose, while writing the system requirement, the requirement engineer makes a mistake. There are two possibilities. First, he can find it by himself and correct it. Second, he delivers the requirement document as a work product to the next stage. In the first case, since the requirement engineer corrected the mistake by himself, no one will ever come to know about this mistake and it will be referred to as the error. But in the second case, since the error made by the requirement engineer is part of the work product, it will be referred to as a defect. Most of the time, these defects are found by the tester or reviewer during the review process. And after getting the feedback from the tester or reviewer, the requirement engineer corrects the mistake made by them. But if the requirement document is not reviewed, or if the reviewer could not find these defects, then the defects will be introduced to all the below stages. And finally, the implementation will be wrong. If the implementation is wrong, the delivered software will also have this defect. Now, if the defect is found by the tester or the user while executing the code, it will be referred to as a failure. Let's quickly summarize the points. A person can make an error or mistake, which can lead to the introduction of a defect, which is a fault or a bug, in the software code or in some other related work product. An error that leads to the introduction of a defect in one work product can trigger an error that leads to the introduction of a defect in a related work product. If a defect in the code is executed, this may cause a failure. Now let's see a real industry example to understand this concept in a better way. Suppose this is a requirement. If speed is 120 km per hour or more, then an overspeed warning shall come. Now, this is a code written by a developer. If speed is greater than 120 km per hour, since he forgot to include the equal to sign here, it's a mistake made by him. If the developer, or sometimes called an author, finds a mistake by himself and corrects it, it is referred to as the error. Suppose he could not find this mistake and delivered the code for review. 
The mistake is part of the work product, hence it is referred to as a defect. If the reviewer finds this defect and provides feedback to the author, the author will correct it. But if the defect is not found by the reviewer, but found during the execution of the code by the tester or by the user of the product, it will be referred to as a failure. Now, let's summarize the points. An error is defined as a human action that produces an incorrect result. The definition for defect is a flaw in a component or system that can cause the component or system to fail performing its required function. Failure is defined as a deviation of the component or system from its expected delivery, service, or result. The fault is found by the tester in the development environment, whereas failure is found by the user in operational use, and it happens due to the deviation from the requirement. The fault is the cause of the failure. In this lecture, we will discuss the different causes of defects. There are two main defect causes, normal causes of defect and environmental causes of defect. First, we will have a look into the normal defect causes. Here, we have six different causes. Time pressure, human fallibility, inexperienced and insufficiently skilled people miscommunication or misunderstanding, complexity of the code, and familiar technologies. The first is time pressure. If you are working in an environment where you are given very little time to complete your tasks, then it is possible that you will overlook certain things that may cause a defect. Second is human fallibility. As humans, we are all fallible because fallible means likely to make errors or fail. Nobody's perfect after all. The third cause is inexperienced and insufficiently skilled people. If you work in an organization where there are people without sufficient knowledge or required skill set for the project, then it may result in a defect. The fourth cause is miscommunication or misunderstanding. If your organization or team lacks proper channels of communication, this could also lead to defects. The fifth is the complexity of the code, design, and architecture. This means even if you are an experienced, skilled person, if the code is complex, then you might end up making an error. The sixth cause is new, unfamiliar technologies. If you are working with a technology that you don't know enough about, then this can also result in a defect. In the latest syllabus, one more cause is added, and that is misunderstandings about intrasystem and intersystem interfaces, especially when such intrasystem and intersystem interactions are large in number. If you are working on a small part of the big system, there is a possibility that you may not know the intended use of the system, which may result in interface-related issues. Let's move on to environmental causes. The first cause is radiation. Proceeds of radiation can cause a defect. The next one is electromagnetic field. We all know how on flights we are asked to switch off our mobile phones. This is to avoid creating electromagnetic fields which can cause interference. The third one is pollution. If there are dust particles on the sensor, it could result in an error. And similarly, there could be many other environmental causes. Let's summarize all the points. We covered two causes of defects, normal causes of defect and environmental cause of defects. In the syllabus, we have seven normal defect causes, and they are time pressure, human fallibility, 
inexperienced and insufficiently skilled people, miscommunication or misunderstanding, complexity of the code, unfamiliar technologies, misunderstandings about infrasystem and intersystem interfaces, especially when such intrasystem and intersystem interactions are large in number. And three environmental causes of defect are radiation, electromagnetic field, and pollution. In this lecture, we will talk about defect, root cause, and effect. The learning objective here is to distinguish between the root cause of a defect and its effects. This topic is marked as K2. Let's first see, what is a root cause? A root cause is defined as the earliest actions or conditions that contributed to creating the defects. This means that when you find a defect, you also have to find the first condition that caused the defect. We will see an example of root cause analysis to understand this definition. Suppose we get this requirement. Once the speed is more than 115 km per hour, red light shall glow. The speed needs to be more than 115 km per hour. After getting this feature, customers are unhappy. Because the customer checked this device and observed that there is a defect. Why? Because when he kept the speed to 116, he expected the red light to be on, but he found that it's still off. Now, to figure out why this is a defect, we have to do a root cause analysis. We are in the testing stage now, but we have to go back a step to the implementation stage or coding stage. Here we find that there is a condition that was implemented incorrectly. If speed is equal to or greater than 150 instead of 115. However, our job is not yet done. Remember, we have to find the earliest condition. This means that we have to go one stage back again, which means the requirement or design stage. In this stage, we found that some of the developers have written this system requirement. Red light should glow when speed is more than 150. So, instead of 115, the requirement engineer wrote 150. And because of this, the implementation was done incorrectly, and we found the defect in the coding and customer saw failure. However, our job is not yet done. We have to find the earliest condition. When we investigated, more, it was found that since the communication was verbal, this problem occurred. Now comes the point which you need to understand. Your job is to identify effect, failure, fault, or root cause. The customer being unhappy is an effect. Observation made by the customer is a failure. These two statements are defects. And all these problems occurred due to miscommunication. So this is the root cause. We don't stop at this point. Now we need to find the solution to avoid such problems. So action over here is further communication will be done via email. With this, example one ends. Now we will see one more example to understand the root cause analysis topic. Here is the life cycle of defect root cause analysis. This life cycle starts with a customer complaint which is also the effect. Why is he complaining? Because he has come across a failure. He has received incorrect interest payment calculations. So, the customer is trying to calculate his interests, but received an incorrect result. This was a failure. When we analyze this failure, we find that it was caused by a single line of incorrect code. When we further investigate this defect, we find out that the wrong code was written because the product author misunderstood how to calculate interest. This was the root cause of the defect that made the customer complain. So we have this information. 
the product owner didn't know how to calculate interest. But we can't stop there. We have an entire team. So how is it that the product owner could make this mistake? What we do next is called action. We figure out what to do so this never happens again. We train the product owner and other team members in interest calculation. This way they will not repeat this mistake. So now you see how everything is connected. This is how root cause analysis works. It starts from an effect, that is the complaint, and ends with an action. That is our method to correct the root cause. Now we'll look at why we need to do a root cause analysis. The first point is to prevent a significant number of future defects from being introduced. We want to make sure that new defects don't creep up in the future. The second point is to reduce the occurrence of similar defects in the future. The third point is to improve the process. Let's summarize the lecture. First, we covered the definition of root cause. Root cause is the earliest actions or conditions that contributed to creating the defects. Then, we saw the need of root cause analysis. To prevent a significant number of future defects from being introduced, we want to make sure that new defects don't creep up in the future. To reduce occurrence of similar defects in the future. To improve the process.